Day 25 Transformed by Trouble For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 New International Version It is the fire of suffering that brings forth the gold of godliness. Madame Guillon God has a purpose behind every problem. He uses circumstances to develop our character. In fact, he depends more on circumstances to make us like Jesus than he depends on our reading the Bible. The reason is obvious. You face circumstances 24 hours a day. Jesus warned us that we'd have problems in the world. No one is immune to pain or insulated from suffering, and no one gets to skate through life problem-free. Life is a series of problems. Every time you solve one, another one's waiting to take its place. Not all of them are big, but they're all significant in God's growth process for you. Peter assures us that problems are normal, saying, Don't be bewildered or surprised when you go through fiery trials ahead, for this is no strange, unusual thing that is going to happen to you. God uses problems to draw you closer to himself. The Bible says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those who are crushed in spirit. Your most profound and intimate experiences of worship will likely be in your darkest days. When your heart is broken, when you feel abandoned, when you're out of options, when the pain is great, and you turn to God alone. When in pain, we don't have the energy for superficial prayers. Johnny Erickson Tata notes, when life is rosy, we may slide by with knowing about Jesus, with imitating him and quoting him and speaking of him. But only in suffering will we know Jesus. We learn things about God in suffering we can't learn any other way. God could have kept Joseph out of jail, kept Daniel out of the lion's den, kept Jeremiah from being tossed into the slimy pit, kept Paul from being shipwrecked three times, and kept the three Hebrew young men from being thrown into the blazing furnace, but he didn't. He let those problems happen, and each of those people were drawn closer to God as a result. Problems force us to look to God and depend on Him instead of ourselves. Paul testified to this benefit. We felt doomed to die and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves, but that was good, for then we put everything into the hands of God who alone could save us. You'll never know that God is all you need until God is all you've got. Regardless of the cause, none of your problems could happen without God's permission. Everything that happens to a child of God is father-filtered, and he intends to use it for good, even when Satan and others mean it for bad. Because God is sovereignly in control, accidents are just incidents in God's good plan for you. Because every day of your life was written on God's calendar before you were born, everything that happens to you has spiritual significance. Everything. Romans 8, 28 and 29 explains why. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. Understanding Romans 8, 28 and 29. This is one of the most misquoted and misunderstood passages in the Bible. It doesn't say, God causes everything to work out the way I want it to. Obviously, that's not true. It also doesn't say, God causes everything to work out to have a happy ending on earth. That's not true either. There are many unhappy endings on earth. We live in a fallen world. Only in heaven is everything done perfectly the way God intends. That's why we're told to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To fully understand Romans 8, 28, and 29, you must consider it phrase by phrase. First, we know. Our hope in difficult times is not based on positive thinking, wishful thinking, or natural optimism. It is a certainty based on the truth that God is in complete control of our universe and that he loves us. We know it. That God causes. There is a grand designer behind everything. Your life is not a result of random chance or fate or luck. There is a master plan. History is his story. God is pulling the strings. We make mistakes, 
but God never does. God cannot make a mistake because he's God. Everything. God's plan for your life involves all that happens to you, including your mistakes, your sins, and your hurts. It includes illness, debt, disaster, divorce, and death of loved ones. God can bring good out of the worst evil. He did it at Calvary. He causes everything to work together, not separately or independently. The events in your life work together in God's plan. They are not isolated acts, but interdependent parts of the process to make you like Christ. To bake a cake, you must use flour, salt, raw eggs, sugar, and oil. Eaten individually, each of these items is pretty distasteful or even bitter. But bake them together, and they become delicious. If you'll give God all your distasteful, unpleasant experiences, he will blend them together for good. For the good. Now, it doesn't say that everything in life is good. Much of what happens in our world is evil and bad. But God specializes in bringing good out of it. In the official family tree of Jesus Christ, four women are listed. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Tamar seduced her father-in-law to get pregnant. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was not even Jewish and broke the law by marrying a Jewish man. Bathsheba committed adultery with David, which resulted in her husband's murder. These were not exactly sterling reputations, but God brought good out of bad, and Jesus came through their lineage. God's purpose is greater than our problems, our pain, and even our sin. God works everything for the good of those who love God and are called. This promise is only for God's children. It is not for everyone. All things work for bad for those living in opposition to God and insist on their own way. According to his purpose. What is that purpose? It is that we become like his son. Everything God allows to happen in your life is permitted for that purpose. Building Christ-like character. We are like jewels, shaped with the hammer and chisel of adversity. If a jeweler's hammer isn't strong enough to chip off our rough edges, God uses a sledgehammer. If we're really stubborn, he uses a jackhammer. He will use whatever it takes. Every problem is a character-building opportunity, and the more difficult it is, the greater the potential for building spiritual muscle and moral fiber. Paul said, we know that these troubles produce patience, and patience produces character. What happens to you in life is not nearly as important as what happens inside you. Your circumstances are temporary, but your character will last forever. The Bible often compares trials to a metal refiner's fire, which burns away the impurities. Peter said, these troubles come to prove that your faith is pure. This purity of faith is worth more than gold. A silversmith was asked, how do you know when the silver is pure? He replied, when I see my reflection in it. When you've been refined by trials, people can see Jesus' reflection in you. James said, under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. Now, since God intends to make you like Jesus, he will take you through the same experiences Jesus went through. That includes loneliness, temptation, stress, criticism, rejection, and many other problems. The Bible tells us that Jesus learned obedience through suffering and was made perfect through suffering. Why would God exempt us from what he allowed his own son to experience? Paul said, we go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. Responding to problems like Jesus. Problems don't automatically produce what God intends. Many people become bitter rather than better and never grow up. You have to respond the way Jesus would. First, remember God's plan is good. He knows what's best for you and has your best interests at heart. God told Jeremiah, the plans I have for you are plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Joseph understood this when he told his brothers who sold him into slavery, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Hezekiah echoed the same sentiment about his life-threatening illness. It was for my own good that I had such hard times. Whenever God says no to your request for relief, remember, God is doing what is best for us, training us to live God's holy best. 
It is vital that you stay focused on God's plan, not your pain or problems. It's how Jesus endured the pain of the cross, and we are urged to follow his example. The Bible says, keep your eyes on Jesus, our leader and instructor. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterwards. Corrie ten Boom, who suffered in a Nazi death camp, explained the power of focus. She said, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. Your focus will determine your feelings. The secret of endurance is to remember that your pain is temporary, but your reward will be eternal. Moses endured a life of problems because he was looking ahead to his reward. Paul endured hardship the same way. He said, our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. Don't give in to short-term thinking. Stay focused on the end result. If we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later. Second, rejoice and give thanks. The Bible tells us, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, how is this possible? Notice that God tells us to give thanks in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. God doesn't expect you to be thankful for evil, for sin, for suffering, or for painful consequences in the world. Instead, God wants you to thank him that he will use your problems to fulfill his purposes. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. It doesn't say rejoice over your pain. That's masochism. You rejoice in the Lord. No matter what's happening, you can rejoice in God's love, God's care, God's wisdom, God's power, and God's faithfulness. Jesus said, be full of joy at that time because you have a great reward waiting for you in heaven. We can also rejoice knowing that God is going through the pain with us. We do not serve a distant and detached God who spouts encouraging cliches safely from the sideline. Instead, he enters into our suffering with us. Jesus did it in the incarnation, and his spirit does it in us now. He will never leave us on our own. Finally, refuse to give up. Be patient and persistent. The Bible says, let the process go on until your endurance is fully developed and you will find that you have become men of mature character with no weak spots. Character building is a slow process. Whenever we try to avoid or escape the difficulties of life, we short circuit the process. We delay our growth and actually end up with the worst kind of pain, the worthless type that accompanies denial and avoidance. When you grasp the eternal consequences of your character development, you'll pray fewer comfort me prayers God help me feel good, and more conform me prayers. Use this to make me more like you. You know you're maturing when you begin to see the hand of God in the random, baffling, and seemingly pointless circumstances of life. If you're facing trouble right now, don't ask, why me? Instead, ask, what do you want me to learn? Then trust God and keep on doing what's right. The Bible says you need to stick it out, staying with God's plan, so you'll be there for the promised completion. Don't give up, grow up. Thinking about my purpose on day 25, a point to ponder. There is a purpose behind every problem, a verse to remember, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8 verse 28, New International Version. A question to consider. What problem in my life has caused the greatest growth in me? Day 26. Growing Through Temptation. Happy is the man who doesn't give in and do wrong when he is tempted, for afterwards 
he will get as his reward the crown of life that God has promised those who love him. James chapter 1 verse 12 Living Bible My temptations have been my masters in divinity. Martin Luther Every temptation is an opportunity to do good. On the path to spiritual maturity, even temptation becomes a stepping stone rather than a stumbling block when you realize that it is just as much an occasion to do the right thing as it is to do the wrong thing. Temptation simply provides the choice. While temptation is Satan's primary weapon to destroy you, God wants to use it to develop you. Every time you choose to do good instead of sin, you are growing in the character of Christ. To understand this, you must first identify the character qualities of Jesus. One of the most concise descriptions of his character is the fruit of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These nine qualities are an expansion of the great commandment and portray a beautiful description of Jesus Christ. Jesus is perfect love, perfect joy, perfect peace, patience, and all the other fruit embodied in a single person. To have the fruit of the Spirit is to be like Christ. How then does the Holy Spirit produce these nine fruit in your life? Does he create them instantly? Will you wake up one day and suddenly just be filled with all these characteristics fully developed? No. Fruit always matures and ripens slowly. This next sentence is one of the most important spiritual truths you'll ever learn. God develops the fruit of the Spirit in your life by allowing you to experience circumstances in which you're tempted to express the exact opposite quality. Character development always involves a choice, and temptation provides that opportunity. For instance, God teaches us love by putting some unlovely people around us. It takes no character to love people who are lovely and loving to you. God teaches us real joy in the midst of sorrow when we turn to him. Happiness depends on external circumstances, but joy is based on your relationship to God. God develops real peace within us, not by making things go the way we planned, but by allowing times of chaos and confusion. Anyone can be peaceful watching a beautiful sunset or relaxing on vacation. We learn real peace by choosing to trust God in circumstances in which we are tempted to worry or be afraid. Likewise, patience is developed in circumstances in which we're forced to wait and tempted to be angry or have a short fuse. God uses the opposite situation of each fruit to allow us a choice. You can't claim to be good if you've never been tempted to be bad. You can't claim to be faithful if you've never had the opportunity to be unfaithful. Integrity is built by defeating the temptation to be dishonest. Humility grows when we refuse to be prideful. And endurance develops every time you reject the temptation to give up. Every time you defeat a temptation, you become more like Jesus. Let's talk about how temptation works. It helps to know that Satan is entirely predictable. He has used the same strategy and old tricks since creation. All temptations follow the same pattern. That's why Paul said we're very familiar with his evil schemes. From the Bible we learn that temptation follows a four-step process, which Satan used both on Adam and Eve and on Jesus. In step one, Satan identifies a desire inside of you. It may be a sinful desire, like the desire to get revenge or to control others, or it may be a legitimate, normal desire, like the desire to be loved and valued or feel pleasure. Temptation starts when Satan suggests, with a thought, that you give in to an evil desire or that you fulfill a legitimate desire in a wrong way or at the wrong time. Always beware of shortcuts. They are often temptations. Satan whispers, you deserve it. You should have it now. It will be exciting, comforting, or make you feel better. We think temptation lies around us, but God says it begins within us. If you didn't have the internal desire, the temptation could not attract you. Temptation always starts in the mind, not in circumstances. Jesus said, for from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, eagerness for lustful pleasure, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. 
And James tells us that there is a whole army of evil desires within you. So step one starts with desire. Step two is doubt. Satan tries to get you to doubt what God has said about the sin. Is it really wrong? Did God really say not to do it? Didn't God mean this prohibition for somebody else at some other time? Doesn't God want me to be happy? The Bible warns, watch out, don't let evil thoughts or doubts make any of you turn from the living God. Step three is deception. Satan is incapable of telling the truth, and he's called the father of lies. So anything he tells you will be untrue or just half true. Satan offers his lie to replace what God has already said in his word. Satan says, you will not die. You'll be wiser like God. You can get away with it. No one will ever know. It will solve all your problems. Besides, everyone else is doing it. It's only a little sin. But a little sin is like being a little pregnant. It will eventually show itself. Step four is disobedience. You finally act on the thought you've been toying with in your mind. What began as an idea gets birthed into behavior. You give in to whatever got your attention. You believe Satan's lies and fall into the trap that James warns about. We are tempted when we are drawn away and trapped by our own evil desires. Then our evil desires conceive and give birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear friends. So how do we overcome temptation? Well, understanding how temptation works in itself is helpful, but there are specific steps you need to take to overcome it. First, refuse to be intimidated. Many Christians are frightened and demoralized by tempting thoughts, feeling guilty that they aren't beyond temptation. They feel ashamed just for being tempted. This is a misunderstanding of maturity. You will never outgrow temptation. In one sense, you can consider temptation a compliment. Satan doesn't have to tempt those who are already doing his evil will. They're already his. Temptation is a sign that Satan hates you, not a sign of weakness or worldliness. It's also a normal part of being human and living in a fallen world. Don't be surprised or shocked or discouraged by it. Be realistic about the inevitability of temptation. You will never be able to completely avoid it. The Bible says, when you're tempted, not if you're tempted. Paul advises, remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. It is not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted, yet he never sinned. Temptation only becomes a sin when you give in to it. Martin Luther said, you cannot keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. You can't keep the devil from suggesting thoughts but you can choose not to dwell on them or act on them. For example, many people don't know the difference between physical attraction or sexual arousal and lust. They are not the same. God made every one of us a sexual being, and that's good. Attraction and arousal are the natural, spontaneous, God-given responses to physical beauty, while lust is a deliberate act of the will. Lust is a choice to commit in your mind what you'd like to do with your body. You can be attracted or even aroused without choosing to sin by lusting. Many people, especially Christian men, feel guilty that their God-given hormones are working. When they automatically notice an attractive woman, they assume it is lust and feel ashamed and condemned. But attraction is not lust until you begin to dwell on it. Actually, the closer you grow to God, the more Satan will try to tempt you. The moment you become God's child, Satan, like a mobster hitman, puts out a contract on you. You are his enemy, and he's plotting your downfall. Sometimes while you're praying, Satan will suggest a bizarre or evil thought just to distract you or shame you. Don't be alarmed or ashamed by this, but realize that Satan fears your prayers and will try anything to stop them. So instead of condemning yourself with, how could I think such a thought, treat it as a distraction from Satan and immediately refocus on God. Second, recognize your pattern of temptation and be prepared for it. There are certain situations that make you more vulnerable to temptation than others. Some circumstances will cause you to stumble almost immediately, while others don't bother you much at all. These situations are unique to your weaknesses, and you need to identify them because Satan surely knows them, he knows exactly what will trip you up, 
and he's constantly working to get you into those circumstances. Peter warns, stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and like nothing better than to catch you napping. So ask yourself, when am I the most tempted? What day of the week? What time of the day? Ask, where am I most tempted? At work? At home? At a neighbor's house? At a sports bar? In an airport or a motel out of town? Then ask, who is with me when I'm most tempted? My friends? My coworkers? A crowd of strangers? When I'm all alone? Also, you ought to ask, how do I usually feel when I'm most tempted? It may be when you're tired or lonely or bored. Or maybe when you're depressed or under stress. It may be when you've been hurt or angry or worried or after a big success or a spiritual high. You should identify your typical pattern of temptation and then prepare to avoid these situations as much as possible. The Bible tells us repeatedly to anticipate and be ready to face temptation. Paul says, don't give the devil a chance. Wise planning reduces temptation. Follow the advice of Proverbs. Plan carefully what you do. Avoid evil and walk straight ahead. Don't go one step off the right way. The Bible says God's people avoid evil ways and they protect themselves by watching where they go. Third, request God's help. Heaven has a 24-hour emergency hotline. God wants you to ask him for assistance in overcoming temptation. He says, call on me in times of trouble and I will rescue you and you will honor me. I call this a microwave prayer because it's quick and to the point. Help! SOS! Mayday! Mayday! When temptation strikes, you don't have time for a long conversation with God. You simply cry out, Help! David, Daniel, Peter, Paul, and millions of others have prayed this kind of instant prayer for help in trouble. The Bible guarantees that our cry for help will be heard because Jesus is sympathetic to our struggle. He faced the same temptations we do. He understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. If God is waiting to help defeat temptation, why don't we turn to him more often? Well, honestly, sometimes we don't want to be helped. We want to give in to temptation, even though we know it's wrong. At that moment, we think we know what's best for us more than God does. At other times, we're just embarrassed to ask God for help because we keep giving in to the same temptation over and over. But God never gets irritated or bored or impatient when we keep coming back to him. The Bible says, let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is grace. Then we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. God's love is everlasting and his patience endures forever. If you have to cry out for God's help 200 times a day to defeat a particular temptation, he will still be eager to give mercy and grace. So come boldly. Ask him for the power to do the right thing and then expect him to provide it. Temptation keeps us dependent upon God. Just as the roots grow stronger when the wind blows against the tree, so every time you stand up to a temptation, you become more like Jesus. When you stumble, which you will, it's not fatal. Instead of giving in or giving up, look to God. Expect him to help you and remember the reward that is waiting for you. The Bible says, when people are tempted and still continue strong, they should be happy. After they have proved their faith, God will reward them with life forever. A point to ponder. Every temptation is an opportunity to do good. A verse to remember. God blesses the people who patiently endure testing. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. James chapter 1, verse 12, New Living Translation. A question to consider. What Christ-like character quality can I develop by defeating the most common temptation I face? Day 27, Defeating Temptation Run from anything that gives you the evil thoughts, but stay close to anything that makes you want to do right. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Living Bible Remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. 
He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you will not give in to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, New Living Translation There is always a way out. You may sometimes feel that a temptation is too overpowering for you to bear, but that's a lie from Satan. God has promised to never allow more on you than he puts within you to handle it. He will not permit any temptation that you could not overcome. However, you must do your part too by practicing four biblical keys to defeating temptation. First, refocus your attention on something else. It may surprise you that nowhere in the Bible are we told to resist temptation. We are told to resist the devil, but that's very different, as I'll explain later. Instead, we are advised to refocus our attention, because resisting a thought doesn't work. It only intensifies our focus on the wrong thing and strengthens its allure. Let me explain. Every time you try to block a thought out of your mind, you drive it deeper into your memory. By resisting it, you actually reinforce it. Whatever you resist, persists. This is especially true with temptation. You don't defeat temptation by fighting the feeling of it. The more you fight a feeling, the more it consumes and controls you. You strengthen it every time you think it. Now, since temptation always begins with a thought, the quickest way to neutralize its allure is to turn your attention to something else. Don't fight the thought, just change the channel of your mind and get interested in another idea. This is the first step in defeating temptation. The battle for sin is always won or lost in your mind. Whatever gets your attention will get you. That's why Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust upon a young woman. And David prayed, keep me from paying attention to what is worthless. Have you ever watched a food advertisement on television and suddenly felt you were hungry? Have you ever heard someone cough and immediately felt the need to clear your throat? Have you ever watched someone release a big yawn and felt the urge to yawn yourself? <laughs> you may be yawning right now as I say this. That is the power of suggestion. We naturally move toward what we focus our attention on. The more you think about something, the stronger it takes hold of you. That's why repeating, I must stop eating too much, or I must stop smoking, or I must stop lusting, is a self-defeating strategy. It keeps you focused on what you don't want. It's like announcing, I'm never going to do what my mom did. You're setting yourself up to repeat it. Most diets don't work because they keep you thinking about food all the time, guaranteeing that you'll be hungry. In the same way, a speaker who keeps repeating to herself, don't be nervous, don't be nervous, sets herself up to be nervous. Instead, she should focus on anything except her feelings, on God, on the importance of her speech, or on the needs of those listening. Temptation begins by capturing your attention. What gets your attention arouses your emotions. Then your emotions activate your behavior, and you act on what you felt. The more you focus on, I don't want to do this, the stronger it draws you into its web. Ignoring a temptation is far more effective than fighting it. Once your mind is on something else, the temptation loses its power. So when temptation calls you on the phone, don't argue with it, just hang up. Now sometimes this means physically leaving a tempting situation. This is one time it's okay to run away. Get up and turn off the television set. Walk away from the group that is gossiping. Leave the theater in the middle of the movie. To avoid being stung, stay away from the bees. You do whatever is necessary to turn your attention to something else. Spiritually, your mind is your most vulnerable organ. To reduce temptation, keep your mind occupied with God's word and other good thoughts. You defeat bad thoughts by thinking of something better. This is the principle of replacement. You overcome evil with good. Satan can't get your attention when your mind is preoccupied with something else. That's why the Bible repeatedly tells us to keep our minds focused. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Always think about Jesus Christ. Fill your minds with those things that are good and deserve praise, things that are true and noble and right and pure and honorable. If you're serious about defeating temptation, you must manage your mind and you must monitor your media intake. The wisest man who ever lived warned, be careful how you think. 
Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Don't allow trash into your mind indiscriminately. Be selective. Carefully choose what you think about. Follow Paul's model. We capture every thought and make it give up and obey Christ. Now this takes a lifetime of practice, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can reprogram the way you think. Second, reveal your struggle to a godly friend or support group. You don't have to broadcast it to the whole world, but you need at least one person that you can honestly share your struggles with. The Bible says you're better off to have a friend than to be all alone. If you fall, your friend can help you up, but if you fall without having a friend nearby, you're really in trouble. Now let me be clear. If you're losing the battle against a persistent bad habit or an addiction or a temptation and you're stuck in a repeating cycle of good intention, failure, guilt, you will not get better on your own. You need the help of other people. Some temptations are only overcome with the help of a partner who prays for you, encourages you, and holds you accountable. God's plan for your growth and your freedom includes other Christians. Authentic, honest fellowship is the antidote to your lonely struggle against those sins that just won't budge. God says it's the only way you're going to break free. The Bible says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Do you really want to be healed of that persistent temptation that keeps defeating you over and over? God's solution is plain. Don't repress it. Confess it. Don't conceal it. Reveal it. Revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. Hiding your hurt only intensifies it. Problems grow in the dark and become bigger and bigger, but when exposed to the light of truth, they shrink. You are only as sick as your secrets. So take off your mask and stop pretending you're perfect and walk into freedom. At Saddleback Church, we have seen the awesome power of this principle to break the grip of seemingly hopeless addictions and persistent temptations through a program we developed called Celebrate Recovery. It is a biblical eight-step recovery process based on the Beatitudes of Jesus and built around small support groups. In the past 10 years, over 5,000 lives have been set free from all kinds of habits and hurts and addictions. Today, this program is used in thousands of churches, and I highly recommend it for your church. If you'd like information on it, you can write to me, rick at purposedrivenlife.com. Satan wants you to think that your sin and temptation are unique, so you must keep them all a secret. The truth is, we're all in the same boat. We all fight the same temptations. The Bible says all of us have sinned. Millions have felt what you're feeling and have faced the same struggles you're facing right now. Now, the reason we hide our faults is pride. We want others to think we have everything under control. The truth is, whatever you can't talk about is already out of control in your life. Problems with your finances, your marriage, your kids, your thoughts, your sexuality, your secret habits, or anything. If you could handle it on your own, you would have already done so, but you can't. Willpower and personal resolutions aren't enough. Some problems are too ingrained, too habitual, and too big to solve on your own. You need a small group or an accountability partner who will encourage you, support you, pray for you, love you unconditionally, and hold you accountable. Then you can do the same for them. Whenever someone confides to me, I've never told this to anyone until now, I get excited for that person because I know they are about to experience great relief and liberation the pressure valve is going to be released and for the first time they're going to see a glimmer of hope for their future. It always happens when we do what God tells us to do by admitting our struggles to a godly friend. Let me ask you a tough question. What are you pretending isn't a problem in your life? Let me ask it another way. What are you afraid to talk about? You're not going to solve it on your own. Yes, it is humbling to admit our weaknesses to others, but a lack of humility is the very thing that is keeping you from getting better. The Bible says God sets himself against the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. The third thing you need to do in defeating temptation is resist the devil. After we've humbled ourselves and submitted to God, we are then told to defy the devil. The rest of James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. 
We don't passively resign ourselves to his attacks. We are to fight back. The New Testament often describes the Christian life as a spiritual battle against evil forces, using war terms such as fight, conquer, strive, and overcome. Christians are often compared to soldiers serving in enemy territory. How can we resist the devil? Paul tells us, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The first step is to accept God's salvation. You won't be able to say no to the devil unless you've said yes to Christ. Without Christ, we are defenseless against the devil. But with the helmet of salvation, our minds and our thoughts are protected by God. Remember this, if you are a believer, Satan cannot force you to do anything. He can only suggest. Second, you must use the word of God as your weapon against Satan. Jesus modeled this when he was tempted in the wilderness. Every time Satan suggested a temptation, Jesus countered by quoting scripture. He didn't argue with Satan. He didn't say, I'm not hungry, when tempted to use his powers to meet a personal need. He simply quoted scripture from memory. We must do the same. There is power in God's word, and Satan fears it. Don't ever try to argue with the devil. He's better at arguing than you are, having thousands of years to practice. You can't bluff Satan with logic or your opinion, but you can use the weapon that makes him tremble, the truth of God. This is why memorizing scripture is absolutely essential to defeating temptation. You have quick access to it whenever you're tempted. Like Jesus, you have the truth stored in your heart, ready to be remembered. If you don't have any Bible verses memorized, you've got no bullets in your gun. I challenge you to memorize a verse a week for the rest of your life. Imagine how much stronger you'd be if you did that. Finally, realize your vulnerability. God warns us to never get cocky and overconfident. That is a recipe for disaster. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. That means we're good at fooling ourselves. Given the right circumstances, any of us are capable of any sin. We must never let down our guard and think we're beyond temptation. Don't carelessly place yourself in tempting situations. Avoid them. Remember that it is easier to stay out of temptation than to get out of it. The Bible says, don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God-confidence. Thinking about my purpose on day 27. A point to ponder. There is always a way out. A verse to remember. God is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you will not give in to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13b, New Living Translation. A question to consider. Who could I ask to be a spiritual partner to help me defeat a persistent temptation by praying for me? Day 28. It takes time. Everything on earth has its own time and its own season. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1, Contemporary English Version. I am sure that God who began the good work within you will keep right on helping you grow in His grace until His task within you is finally finished on that day when Jesus Christ returns. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 Living Bible There are no shortcuts to maturity. It takes years for us to grow to adulthood and it takes a full season for fruit to mature and ripen. The same is true for the fruit of the Spirit. The development of Christ-like character cannot be rushed. Spiritual growth, like physical growth, takes time. When you try to ripen fruit quickly, it loses its flavor. In America, tomatoes are usually picked unripened so they won't bruise during shipping to the stores. Then before they're sold, these green tomatoes are sprayed with CO2 gas to turn them red instantly. 
Gas tomatoes are edible, but they're no match for the flavor of a vine-ripened tomato that's allowed to mature slowly. While we worry about how fast we grow, God is concerned about how strong we grow. God views our lives from and for eternity, so he's never in a hurry. Lane Adams once compared the process of spiritual growth to the strategy the Allies used in World War II to liberate islands in the South Pacific. First, they would soften up an island, weakening the resistance by shelling the enemy stronghold with bombs from offshore ships. Next, a small group of Marines would invade the island and establish a beachhead, a tiny fragment of the island that they could control. Once the beachhead was secured, they would begin the long process of liberating the rest of the island, one bit of territory at a time. Eventually, the entire island would be brought under control, but not without some costly battles. Adams drew this parallel. Before Christ invades our lives at conversion, he sometimes has to soften us up by allowing problems we can't handle. While some open their lives to Christ the first time he knocks at the door, most of us are resistant and defensive. Our pre-conversion experience is Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and bomb. The moment you open yourself to Christ, God gets a beachhead in your life. You may think you have surrendered all of your life to him, but the truth is there's a lot of your life that you aren't even aware of. You can only give God as much of you as you understand at that moment. That's okay. Once Christ is given a beachhead, he begins the campaign to take over more and more territory until all of your life is completely his. There will be struggles and battles, but the outcome will never be in doubt. God has promised that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. Discipleship is the process of conforming to Christ. The Bible says we arrive at real maturity, that measure of development which is meant by the fullness of Christ. Christ likeness is your eventual destination, but your journey will last a lifetime. So far, we've seen that this journey involves believing through worship, belonging through fellowship, and becoming through discipleship. Every day, God wants you to become a little more like him. The Bible says you have begun to live the new life in which you are being made new and are becoming like the one who made you. Today, we're obsessed with speed, but God is more interested in strength and stability than swiftness. We want the quick fix, the shortcut, the on-the-spot solution. We want a sermon, a seminar, an experience that will instantly resolve all our problems, remove all our temptations, and release us from all our pains. But real maturity is never the result of a single experience, no matter how powerful or moving. Growth is gradual. The Bible says our lives gradually become brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. Why does it take so long? Although God could instantly transform us, he has chosen to develop us slowly. Jesus is deliberate in developing his disciples. Just as God allowed the Israelites to take over the promised land little by little so they wouldn't be overwhelmed, he prefers to work in incremental steps in our lives. Why does it take so long to change and grow up? Well, there are several reasons. First, we're slow learners. We often have to relearn a lesson 40 or 50 times to really get it. The problems keep recurring and we think, not again, I've already learned that. But God knows better. The history of Israel illustrates how quickly we forget the lessons God teaches us and how soon we revert to our old patterns of behavior. We need repeated exposure. Second, we have a lot to unlearn. Many people go to a counselor with a personal or relational problem that took years to develop. And they say, I need you to fix me now. I've got an hour. They naively expect a quick solution to a long-standing, deep-rooted difficulty. Since most of our problems and all of our bad habits didn't develop overnight, it's unrealistic to expect them to go away immediately. There is no pill or prayer or principle that will instantly undo the damage of many years. It requires the hard work of removal and replacement. The Bible calls it taking off the old self and putting on the new self. While you were given a brand new nature at the moment of conversion, you still have old habits and patterns and practices that need to be removed and replaced. Third, we are often afraid to humbly face the truth about ourselves. I've already pointed out that the truth will set us free, but it often makes us miserable first. 
The fear of what we might discover if we honestly faced our character defects keeps us living in a prison of denial. Only as God is allowed to shine the light of his truth on our faults, our failures, and our hang-ups can we begin to work on them. This is why you cannot grow without a humble, teachable attitude. Fourth, growth is often painful and scary. There is no growth without change, and there is no change without fear or loss, and there is no loss without pain. Every change involves a loss of some kind. You must let go of old ways in order to experience the new. We fear these losses, even if our old ways were self-defeating, because like a worn-out pair of shoes, they were at least comfortable and familiar. People often build their identity around their defects. We say, it's just like me to be, and it's just the way I am. The unconscious worry is that if I let go of my habit, my hurt, or my hang-up, who will I be? This fear can definitely slow down your spiritual growth. Fifth, habits take time to develop. Remember that your character is the sum total of your habits. You can't claim to be kind unless you are habitually kind. You show kindness without even thinking about it. You can't claim to have integrity unless it is your habit to always be honest. A husband who is faithful to his wife most of the time is not faithful at all. Your habits define your character. There's only one way to develop the habits of Christ-like character. You must practice them, and that takes time. There are no instant habits. Paul urged Timothy, practice these things. Devote your life to them so that everyone can see your progress. If you practice something over time, you get good at it. Repetition is the mother of character and skill. These character-building habits are often called spiritual disciplines, and there are dozens of great books that can teach you how to do these. Again, you can write to me for a recommended list of books on spiritual growth. Don't get in a hurry. As you grow to spiritual maturity, there are several ways to cooperate with God in the process. First, believe that God is working in your life even when you don't feel it. Spiritual growth is sometimes tedious work, one small step at a time. Expect gradual improvement. The Bible says everything on earth has its own time and its own season. There are seasons in your spiritual life, too. Sometimes you'll have a short, intense burst of growth, the springtime, followed by a period of stabilizing and testing, fall and winter. What about those problems and habits and hurts that you would like miraculously removed? Well, it's fine to pray for a miracle, but don't be disappointed if the answer comes through a gradual change. Over time, a slow, steady stream of water will erode the hardest rock and turn giant boulders into pebbles. And over time, a little sprout can turn into a giant redwood tree towering 350 feet tall. Second, keep a notebook or journal of lessons learned. This is not a diary of events, but a record of what you are learning. Write down the insights and the life lessons God teaches you about Him, about yourself, about your life, about relationships, and everything else. Record these so you can review and remember them and pass them on to the next generation. The reason we must relearn lessons is that we forget them. Reviewing your spiritual journal regularly can spare you a lot of unnecessary pain and heartache. The Bible says it's crucial that we keep a firm grip on what we've heard so that we don't drift off. Third, be patient with God and with yourself. One of life's frustrations is that God's timetable is rarely the same as ours. We're often in a hurry when God isn't. You may feel frustrated with the seemingly slow progress you're making in life. Remember that God is never in a hurry, but he's always on time. He will use your entire lifetime to prepare you for your role in eternity. The Bible is filled with examples of how God uses a long process to develop character, especially in leaders. He took 80 years to prepare Moses, including 40 in the wilderness. For 14,600 days, Moses kept waiting and wondering, is it time yet? But God kept saying, not yet. Contrary to popular book titles, there are no easy steps to maturity or secrets to instant sainthood. When God wants to make a mushroom, he does it overnight. But when God wants to make a giant oak, he takes a hundred years. Great souls are grown through struggles and storms and seasons of suffering. So be patient with the process. James advised, 
Don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you will become mature and well-developed. Finally, don't get discouraged. When Habakkuk became depressed because he didn't think God was acting quickly enough, God had this to say. These things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair, for these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. A delay is not a denial from God. Remember how far you've come, not just how far you have to go. You're not where you want to be, but neither are you where you used to be. Years ago, people wore a popular button with the letters P-B-P-G-I-N-F-W-M-Y. It stood for, please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. God isn't finished with you either, so keep on moving forward. Even the snail reached the ark by persevering. Thinking about my purpose on day 28. A point to ponder. There are no shortcuts to maturity. A verse to remember. God began doing a good work in you, and I am sure he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, New Century Version. A question to consider. In what area of my spiritual growth do I need to be more patient and persistent? Purpose 4. You were shaped for serving God. We are simply God's servants. Each one of us does the work which the Lord gave him to do. I planted the seed. Apollos watered the plant, but it was God who made the plant grow. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, today's English version. <music> 